Hello Year 12 students, welcome to the fourth video of the Station 11 series. Um, this video is on chapter, not chapter four, part four, the starship. And in just in terms of the symbolic uh, meaning of the title, uh, first read through, I'm just like, what on earth does this represent? Um, <clears throat> I think there's a couple of different ways we can interpret it. I just want to propose that to you that in general, think about the fact that starships um, can fly freely wherever they want between planets. Therefore, there is that symbolic meaning of freedom, exploration, discovery, hope, justice, uh, because there's a connection to with um, the... Um, Star Trek reference, survival is insufficient. It also refers to, in this section, there is an actual starship that is found in one of the abandoned houses. So there's the physical starship enterprise toy, the little metal toy that's found. So it has a literal meaning for an object in this section, but it also has a, a more metaphoric meaning, which I think you can see there. So it certainly connects to the main themes, survival is insufficient, um, the significance of freedom and, of course, um, August's obsession with the television show. <clears throat> and so that's what I'd like to propose about the title of the section. I'm just going to go through now these different um, things for you to pay attention to, starting with Chapter 19. And um, we're back now, 20 years post-pandemic, and the Travelling Symphony are now trying to run away from Sib Deborah by the waters. Um, they recognise that the prophet's a bit psycho. Um, in terms of your essays, I, I colloquial, colloquially will say that he's a bit insane, psycho, crazy. But the word that I'm asking you to use for your essays will be fanatic or extremist or extremist, uh, extremist. You might call him a fundamentalist. Mentalist. There's a few other things, terms that you could brainstorm for how you could refer to him in a text response, a formal text response essay. Anyway, <clears throat> um, so there's a couple of themes straight away that we notice here: a description of the like explicit instruction, explicit reference to the importance of art, how sometimes they talk about what they're doing as noble um, and they actually say that art is important, their art is important. So, but other times it doesn't feel worth it because of the difficult and dangerous way it is to survive when they're traveling, camping between towns, traveling in snow or rain, um, actors and musicians carrying guns and crossbows imagery there again reinforcing the savagery the difficulty of life in this post-pandemic world <clears throat> um, of course times when there's the heat that's unrelenting and the reference again to the motto of the traveling symphony that is on the lead caravan um, Dieter actually Ex, uh, explains the reference to Star Trek here that it is actually from a Star Trek episode. The quote would be way more profound if they hadn't lifted it from Star Trek. And Kirsten had these words tattooed on her left forearm at the age of 15. So the motto, survival is insufficient, is actually tattooed on Kirsten's left forearm. She embodies this view, Mum, Mandel's view. Um, also the tattoos of the two black knives that are on the back of her right wrist because they, uh, we learn later, what well, we can infer referring to her kills, marking specific events. Um, Kirsten says that this line is her favourite line of text in the whole world. Um, survival is insufficient. Again, showing how much she actually is the physical embodiment of Mandel's view. Um, pay the next page, you'll see um, <clears throat> it's interesting. Kirsten is um, thinking about the fact that the prophet's dog has the same name as the dog in the comic books. Um, 
of course, that is foreshadowing the connection between them and um, people who are paying attention may start noticing the, um, the hints from here of the prophet's identity. Um, the um, August explains the episode of Star Trek Voyager. If you have not yet watched it, it is worth having a look. If you pop into Google, survival is insufficient, Star Trek Voyager, you will find this um, clip, five-minute clip with a summary uh, from the original, like where it originally came from. Um, it's interesting, you'll notice uh, Kirsten wasn't sure if she actually remembered anything of Star Trek or if she's just been told about it so many times that she started to picture stories in our head. And it's funny because memory is one of those things like that. Sometimes we're told stories and we remember being told the story, not the actual memory itself. And how memory is created is a really interesting thing. But one thing that in this uh, chapter you'll notice is the conflict perhaps, not conflict, but the contrast between Deirdre and Kirsten. Um, Kirsten's lack of memory of the new world. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, juxtaposed with Dieter's strong memories um, and how he struggles because of it. Um, okay, page 121. Um, there's another section here about memory and a yearning for connection. Um, the process of them leaving St. Deborah by the water, um, the walking, having guards, cooking. They talk about electricity in the former world. Alexandra, remember, she's the 15-year-old girl um, and is trying to learn about how air conditioning works, how it used to be that air conditioning would just have cold air coming out of a vent. Um, and then they find a stowaway. And Eleanor, the stowaway, is discovered. She's hidden in the caravan um, underneath some blankets because they left in such a hurry. Um, and what we find out is this young girl, she's 12 years old. Um, she's actually promised to be um, the next bride of the prophet who already has four wives and then she's going to be the next one. Um, and, of course, making some note about the, the cruelty um, that that um, reveals about the prophet. And... Uh, why would he marry a 12-year-old? Well, he had a dream where God told him he was to repopulate the earth. Uh, clearly, our modern readers can recognise the fanatic, delusional um, nature of the prophet's comments and claims, um, which is obviously inviting our disapproval as readers of those who manipulate or attempt to manipulate or indoctrinate others. So note a views and values statement there about Mandel's thematic concerns. Um, Eleanor gives them some information about Jer Charlie and Jeremy and the fact that they've gone to the Museum of Civilization. We learn that is in an airport and they have to decide what are they going to do with Eleanor. They d wouldn't normally allow a uh, stowaway they know that they risk accusations of kidnapping if they take her along with them they don't get involved they have a strict policy of non-intervention in the politics of the towns that they pass through but nobody can imagine delivering this child bride back to the prophet they wonder if there's a grave marker that's been placed by um with her name on it already and they learn that the prophet is from the Museum of Civilization. Again, some foreshadowing there. Um, and he's come from Deborah by the Water. So the prophet's history, what they learn about, um, 
he left his um the head of a sect of religious wanderers come to this town St Deborah by the water they told them they'd come in peace um few people were uneasy there's some history about them bringing they were friendly at first they shared they meet they seemed harmless and the man who was the leader who was a tall man with blonde hair called himself a messenger note that prophet actually means messenger no one knows his name but he says he came from the museum of civilization and he's spreading his message of light um i have spoken about the fact that it, um mandel's views on religion that while it may seem on an initial reading that it is critical of religion my argument is that it isn't religion per se so much as the danger of religion or religious messages if left in the hands of those who are power hungry unstable who use it to manipulate indoctrinate others um and we see that the prophet who he tells a story when he comes in um about a collapsed bridge um three men died when the bridge fell into the river and he said oh, look oh so he had a raven he had um sorry a vision of three ravens and um then they saw a collapsed bridge and three people had died when the bridge fell into the river and he says that I saved you because of the vision, basically. Um, and the note that I've made here is that he's attempting to assert his superiority and the fact that he has this design protection. And so we see it's some sort of a danger of the, um, a sort of a warning of the danger of absolute power in the wrong hands and also the danger of blindly following. Um, so he kind of takes over the town here and Eleanor doesn't know why the dog has, <laughs> why the prophet's dog has the same name as, um, as the comic. And section 20, uh, um, chapter 20, they are eating deer for dinner. Just another example of survival skills that are needed. Um, Kirsten touches a lamp and imagines it on and the electricity on. The electricity is a motif that continues to present uh, this ideal image of hope for this new world, much like um, um, uh, planes as well, perhaps. Um, they go scouting um, find a school and so um viola whose actual name actually isn't viola but she's taken on the name of her instrument after the collapse so she plays the instrument the viola and she's taken on the name viola and many of the characters you'll notice are referred to by the instrument they play the clarinet the tuba the um and um i i've just questioned why would people do this why has mandel inserted it but why would somebody go by the instrument and i think it says something to do with the significance of um the instrument and the role as part of their identity that it becomes their name um i think you could explore that as a concern of mandel if you want to have um something to play around with anyway they find uh some things in the school they find a mouthpiece for a flute and a skeleton in the men's room that's got a bullet hole in the skull um and august says a prayer over the dead that's what he does um there is some signs in school like lady gaga is the bomb um which kind of i guess references to real people that we know as readers does invite us to imagine this tragedy actually happening in our world and what would happen to our world it makes it far more real to us using the references of celebrities actual famous celebrities and uh at the bottom here there is a commentary that um How do people stand it, referring to 
I guess, the things that they have to do in order to survive in the real world, this new world. And Kirsten says, we stand it because we were younger than you when everything ended, but not young enough to remember nothing at all. Um, because we're always looking for the former world before all traces of the former world are gone. But it seemed too much to explain all of this, so she just shrugs. This idea of searching for meaning and purpose. And my question is, why search for this former world at all in this new world? What significance does it have? Um, and um, they never allow Alexander or they hide the uh, truth about the skeleton in the men's room from Alexander out of sort of a desire to protect her from the harshness of this world as it is softening. Um, we jump back to an interview in year 15 and um, Kirsten is asked about the two black knives or the tattoos, uh, the, the text on her arm and then the two black knives and she just answers, you know what tattoos like this mean. Perhaps you could tell me, she says, I won't talk about it, Francois, you know, better than to ask. Um, and perhaps think about why she might not want to talk about it. Um, maybe there's a sense of shame, a dislike of the brutality of this new world, or is it something else? Have a think about that. Chapter 22. Um, in this chapter... <clears throat> there's a discussion about the fact at the beginning that the world was softening. So 20 years into this world, this post-pandemic world, there is a fair chance Kirsten thinks that Alexander would live her life out without ever having to kill anyone. Um, she was younger, a younger 15-year-old than Kirsten had ever been. Kirsten had lived a lot through surviving as she did through the immediate years post-pandemic, those unspeakable years as they are referred to. Um, there's definitely a sense that they're trying to protect um, Alexandra, but she wants to grow up. She wants to go and join in the scouting parties, the expedition to the school. Um, Dieter talks about dreaming of an aeroplane, subtly foreshadowing the aeroplanes that become significant in the chapters to come at the Severn Airport. And oh, here is the section about the memory, that conflict between Dieta and Kirsten and their memory. So what I referred to earlier here. Um, so you don't remember anything, but she does remember things. She was eight, but Dieta was 20 when uh, the world ended. So he remembers everything. And these two people placed next to each other um, the pain and the difficulty of living in the new world having re strong memories of the old one versus people like Kirsten who might perhaps only have vague memories um, anyway Dieter talks about the aeroplane and how the aeroplane um, represents hope that if they saw an aeroplane it meant that somewhere there's still plane civil um, taking off and he would look to the skies for a whole decade after the pandemic, 10 years he would look to the skies hoping to be rescued, hoping to be saved. And he dreamt about this plane finally coming, which represented there was still civilization somewhere, and then he woke up. So um, in this next section, they are second watch overnight, and there's gone off in pairs, Dieta and Saeed behind them, 500 or half a mile behind them, Kirsten and August keeping watch at the camp and the guitar and the oboe half a mile ahead. And so they take watch, uh, the second watch during the night. Um, and um, she, so Kirsten remembers getting in a plane and her own memories of being in a plane and they chat about maybe not traveling anymore and what it would look like. And then they hear uh, a disturbance, somebody cry out maybe, um, and they both hear it. So they raise the third watch to try and work out what's happened. There's an owl that flies down low. Keeping in mind the owl uh, as a night bird, 
often and is a um, a sign, a portend of doom. Um, you'll find in like Gothic novels, you often will have um, that owl symbolism used. And Kirsten grabs her knife tightly. They're looking for Said and Dieter, but it seems like they've been plucked from the face of the earth. There's no trace, no footprints, no sign of large animals. They've just disappeared, which is really spooky. And then chapter 23, nobody can understand how they could just have disappeared. Their disappearances were incomprehensible. Um, and... Another reference down here to survival being insufficient, uh, this question that dogs the symphony ever since. Um, so now the symphony has to work out what to do and the conductor says has to make the call and the conductor basically says, look, um, since the symphony has been established, there's been four times where we've separated, people have become separated, and we follow the separation protocol. That's um, if you're ever, and Alexandra states it, if you're ever separated, you make your way to the destination and then you wait. And the destination is the Museum of Civilization. Museum of Civilization. And so that's the action that they decide to take, despite the fact that Saeed and Dieter have been gone. Um, she has um, been on the road 15 years since the start of the Travelling Symphony. And um, these guys have been there with them for 12 years and even longer. And she doesn't want to take the, but she won't risk the rest of them. She's following the separation protocol to protect the travelling symphony. Um, there's a sense of being caught in a terrible dream. And there is heat, terrible heat, the fevered summers, this impossible heat. Um, and I don't know whether I mentioned earlier, but certainly the references in the post-pandemic world are often set in incredible, irrepressible um, relenting, unrelenting, relentless heat, uh, representing the tension, the difficulty, exhaustion of life in this post-pandemic world. Perhaps that's my case that I'll make, um, certainly contrasting with the unrelenting cold of the time when the pandemic hit. Uh, there's a discussion of the prophet and them calling themselves the light um, and if you are the light and your enemies are the, dar are the darkness, so if you think you're the light and your enemies are the darkness, evil, bad, then there's nothing you cannot justify. There's nothing you cannot survive because there's nothing you will not do. Is survival worth killing for was the question this comes to me. Is that justifiable to kill in order to save a life or many lives perhaps? And then later Sydney disappears. Um, and so Sydney is just disappears. Um, she, Jackson and Sydney are together. He turns around and she just goes, and that's incredibly creepy. Uh, again, tension of the fear that's created in this chapter. Um, Obviously, it's to do with the prophet and they, the disappearances one after another are almost supernatural. Um, there's this sense of them being stalked or hunted. Are we being hunted, Alexandra says. Um, and then, because they're disappearing so quietly, um, and then later in the day, they find in the in the clarinet's belongings, in Sydney's belongings, they find the note. Dear friends, I find myself immeasurably weary. I've gone to rest in the forest. It ends there. Um, it's, the date suggests it's been written 11 months earlier or the clarinet didn't know what year or month it was. Perhaps that's this was an era where exact dates were seldom relevant. So those sorts of details are not necessarily as um, important as they are today. Um you know, in terms of a disaster, those details become less significant. What is important in the world? They decide that it is a suicide note. It showed suicidal intent, says Lynn, and, and they all seem to 
uh, come to some sort of um, agreement that that is what's happened. But um, they start to feel regret. They should have been paying more attention. Interestingly, later on, we discover that she's actually writing a play and this was just the beginning of her play, but she never wrote any more. Um, but certainly it indicates that they feel like they should have been paying attention, perhaps revealing that sense that we should appreciate what we have and who we have. Don't take the people and the freedoms and everything that we have for granted. Um, and so without Dieta, without Saeed, without the clarinet, they are, um, they're conspicuous in their absence and they just have this sense, or uh, Kirsten in particular has a sense of agony um, particularly Saeed, who she's in the relationship with or had been in the relationship with. She has shallow breath in her chest and she is tears that are silent and constant. Her agony is clear. She finds a poem in her pocket that August has written for her, um, again referencing the starship, which is the motif for this chapter, a fragment for my friend. If your soul left this earth, I would follow and find you silent, my starship suspended in the night. Um, I think it's worth analysing that. Um, when you have time on your own, play around with it. Certainly uh, the connections to freedom, exploration, justice, hope, um, and August and Kirsten are together. They find a golf course. They're pretty happy about it because they found good things in a golf course before. Um, the land becomes wilder. They, in the golf course, they go fishing and they, um, the steam is rising from the road. Um, they try and find the symphony again, but... Uh, they've disappeared. They've become separated. Um, so now August and Kirsten are alone. Um, and so the, the unfolding tension, they can't kind of understand why symphon the symphony would leave in a downpour of rain um, unless there was an emergency. But they decide because the fish will go bad in the heat that – um, they're going to cook the fish and eat them because it's safer to light a fire in the daylight. And so they cook the fish um, and then there is this thought of Kirsten that hell is the absence of people you long for. Uh, there is a reference to a quote, hell is other people. And I think somewhere, I can't remember where it is, that it says actually they – um, there, there, it's graffiti somewhere and some people have crossed out other people and written flutes. I can't remember where it's from. I just remember. Um, so there is a circular reference there. Chapter 24. Um, they are on their second day without the symphony and these descriptive passages reinforce the danger of the post-pandemic world. Um, there's um, bullet holes in cars, there's skeletons in um, the cars and then they come. They meet this guy who's got a scar on his face, a complicated scar on his face. So they run into this guy and he is not completely unfriendly because the pleasure of being alive in year 20, which is a karma age, um, means that he isn't going to shoot them on site, whereas the first 10 years they might shoot them on site. They explain that they're on their way to the Museum of Civilization and they've lost their friends. Um, and this guy whose name is Finn, he um, he chats with them and there's a description here of the scar. It seems like a deliberate pattern. And uh, the irony of artifacts from the old world where the entire world is a place where artifacts from the old world are pre preserved. It's interesting. Um, there's a couple of kids. They recognize each other or rather Kirsten recognizes the kids for the twins who used to be in St. Deborah. They, I guess, recognize, Finn recognizes the traveling symphony. Uh, they remember 
Well, Finn remembers the Travelling Symphony and and he was there when the prophet took over. He refers to the prophet as the craziest damn people I ever met in my life and a few of us just took our kids and fled. Um, they remembered Charlie and Jeremy as well who left a few days before Finn did. And here the scar snapped into focus, a lowercase t with an extra line, the symbol that she's seen before spray painted on the buildings in September by the water. And so um, it's supposed to look like a plane. I have been trying to rack my brain and I want to thank, shout out Sophie Coles who drew this for me with a smaller thing to make it look like a wings and um, the center of a plane with a tail perhaps. Um, notice the T for Tyler as well who we know the prophet's name is. Um, and the beauty of this new world where everyone, almost everyone is gone, if hell is other people, what is a world with almost no people in it? Perhaps soon humanity would simply flicker out, but Kirsten found this more peaceful than sad. Maybe the end of humanity isn't such a bad thing. Um, and so they fear over the what happened to the Travelling Symphony. They find now an untouched house and and something they've ne not found in years, like a hidden gem. Um, and so there's a graphic description of the child is in bed, the parents are in bed. He's got a little league uniform with his the photo of the kid in the little league uniform with his parents kneeling on either side. They August finds a metal Starship Enterprise, this motif that's here. Um, and he says a prayer over both the boy and his parents. Kirsten flips the light switch and, of course, nothing happens. But I wonder if because the house feels untouched, she actually feels like maybe it will work. I don't know why she does this. She's straining to remember what it had been like when it actually did work, that you walk into a room, flip a switch, and the room floods with light. She's not sure if she remembers or if she only imagined remembering. Again, that theme of memory. Um, she finds a wedding gown, she finds things for costumes um, and um, tries to not think of the t symphony. August tries to find a TV guide and she's looking for Dr. Eleven, but she would settle for Dear V and Dear V is a book that she misplaced on the road. Um, the book belonged to her mother. It was an unauthorised portrait, again, the connection with Arthur Leander. Um, she took it with her because her mother had told her she wasn't allowed to read it, so it's the only book that she took with her, and now she's trying to find another one. And there is a big segue here to Chapter 25, um, and it's letters from Dear V. So there's the connection here. So obviously this is way pre-pandemic. I don't know exactly which year, but um, when Arthur is a teen and the ideas here really are the, um, un like the, the recognition of Arthur's regrets and his change in character that we see through Arthur's own words. So these are letters Arthur has written to his friend Victoria that later is published and um, it's worth having a read of that. There is the Comet Hyakutake, which is referred to a couple of times. Um, I have questioned what does it represent. I don't know yet, so maybe next time we actually come across it, I'll have a greater sense of that. I've tried to work it out. If you have some idea about what it represents, pop it in the comments. Um, maybe explore it with your, with your friends. Um, but we definitely see Arthur's loneliness unfolding through the letters um, we see him as he moves on with his acting career um, and he's kind of using V like a bit of a therapist uh, writing even though she's not writing back and pouring out like a journal I guess that's what Arthur refers to it later um, and the idea, I guess, is that the letters are all about him. He's not asking her about her life. He, he is um, 
make taking advantage or using her in a way um and he describes you know decades pass he meets miranda marries miranda uh, cheats on miranda justifies infidelity um refers to the dinner party from chapter 15 that we've read already um and the very end here talks about the fact that love is like the lion's tooth there's a hint of instability in the friendship between clark and arthur um and we get this sense of arthur's life in turmoil which actually says explicitly all is in turmoil and then we jump in chapter 26 to a really interesting chapter that is three weeks pre-pandemic where Clark and Elizabeth learn about the publish publication of the Dear V letters who are described as being unsparing in the description of Arthur's life and his relationships. Um, and um, Elizabeth says that he'll just start rambling, deflecting, obfuscating. I think it's worth looking up those words. Uh, <clears throat> the polysyndeton there, it's a description of Arthur's character. Um, definitely worth learning that quote from Elizabeth. Um, they get the sense that he's acting. His life is a performance. Um and there is this interesting sequence here which just seems to, in a way, have no purpose, but I think it has a really strong purpose thematically uh, revealing um, the concerns of Mandel about this idea of the meaning of life. And my comment here is I really think that we see the author's views and values through the voice of Dahlia in this interaction. So basically what happens is Clark... So we jump into the narrative perspective of Clark, even though, of course, it's third-person omniscient narrator, but we are following Clark's point of view. Um, and he describes his job. He conducts 360 assessments, 360-degree assessments. Basically, that's a business term that means you interview people above on the same level and below you and come up with kind of a strengths and weaknesses report on how people can improve after getting the truth about what they really like to work with, work for, and work under. Um, and so that's what Clark does. And he describes this one day where he's giving, he, he's going through this 360 degree and he describes the being trapped behind iPhone zombies, people who are half his age, wandering in a dream with their eyes fixed on their screens who he jostles on purpose and they make him feel like punching walls, like throwing himself across a dance floor. You know how angry people make when they walk slow in front of you because they're on their iPhones. The sense of frustration, we can all recognize that um, yet. Um, he arrives for this interview with Dahlia and... They, the, the conversation that they have, I believe, refers to this idea that it's not possible to change somebody else and maybe we should focus on our own flaws. Um, she, Dahlia is really philosophical. Um, pages 162 and 163 are really worth looking at. Um, she questions the people, so you've been doing this 20, 21 years, the people you coach, do they actually ever change in any lasting notable way? And he's actually always wondered about it and says they change their behaviours or some of them. So she's like, well, you differentiate between changing people and changing behaviours. And Dahlia says, oh, look, my boss, Dan, I reckon you can coach him and he'll exhibit a turnaround like he might change some of his behaviors he'll improve in concrete errors but he'll still be a joyless bastard um basically what she means is that he will still be even if you coach him he'll change a little but he'll still be a successful but unhappy person who works till 9 p.m every night because he's got a terrible marriage doesn't want to go home um and 
I think what I've observing here is this tendency in our modern world that so for so many people today work is meaningless and soul destroying and perhaps Mandel is criticizing our focus on uh, superficial success at the expense of what gives life true meaning our relationships art and other things so this Clark's interview with Dahlia really reviews her criticism of modern attitudes towards walk at work. Um, she says it's like the corporate world is full of ghosts. Actually, parents not in the her parents are not in the corporate world, but they're in academia, and they're also full of ghosts. She says maybe adulthood is full of ghosts. People who ended up in one life instead of another, and they are just so disappointed high functioning sleepwalkers that is a great quote there for you to learn in connection with views um dahlia, uh, dahlia mandel's thematic concerns about work okay um and so clark realizes this inexpressible longing Clark and also other real readers realize they've also felt this that they are sleepwalkers they are high functioning sleepwalkers and it ends up this is what passes for a life what passes for happiness says Dahlia guys like Dan they're sleepwalkers and nothing ever jolts them awake and Clark thinks to himself about the book Dear V, about sleepwalking. Maybe Arthur has seen that Clark was sleepwalking because he had been sleepwalking. He realizes, yes, he's sleepwalking. He's been half asleep through the motions of his life for a while now. Not specifically unhappy, but when had he last found real joy in his work? When was the last time he'd been truly moved by anything? When had he last felt awe or inspiration? And he wishes he could somehow go back and find the iPhone zombies, the people he jostled on the side work earlier, earlier and apologized to them. I'm sorry. I've just realized that I'm as minimally present in this world as you are and I had no right to judge you. And he wanted to call every target of every 360 degree report and apologize to them too because it's an awful thing to appear in somebody else's report. And he saw that now and it's an awful thing to be the target. Yeah, so all of the ghosts in our corporate academic world, adulthood, the meaninglessness of his work in the scheme of things, particularly when we consider the entire narration in the scheme of survival of the post-pandemic world, the fact that they, some of these jobs don't necessarily contribute a huge amount of meaning to his life. I think it's in really interesting that's something that you should be aware of. So I'm going to stop there and we're going to go on in next video to Toronto. <laughs>